would also like to apologize because uh, I had a misconception that this uh, surgical pulse was going to be in the next week, in the coming week. So I was quite unprepared until a day earlier. So uh, excuse me for my uh, uh, less than normal quality slides. So th the topic which I was given was uh, treatment of carcinoma, CA prostate and risk advances. Uh, in next uh, 15 minutes, quite hard for me to cover all the aspects of personal prostate and recent advances and uh, given the fact that most of the crowd is uh, 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 comprises easy residents are dealing only on the important aspects of management of CA prostate. So uh, uh, we all know that carcinoma prostate is the, is the most common non skin cancer in the United States. This is the data which I have taken from Campbell's. Uh, <coughs> And it's the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Second leading cause of cancer death. The important point is that most of the prostate cancers are internal, they are not aggressive. So most of the patients who has a prostate cancer would die with prostate cancer rather than dying of prostate cancer. So which is why only 3% of prostate cancers die of the disease. They would rather die of natural cause than of the cancer itself. So what then is the histology of prostate cancer? All of us know and agree that it's adenocarcinoma. Rare histological findings include uh, urothelial CA, sometimes uh, neuroendocrine differentiation of adenocarcinoma, sarcomas. But then adenocarcinoma is by far the most common. Uh, uh, important histological point which I, uh, which I uh, wanted to highlight is that prostatic epithelial cells stain positive for prostatic acid phosphatase and PSA. PSA is an important marker of CA prostate. Prostate cancers, uh, cancer never has a basal cell layer, whereas normal prostate gland has a basal cell layer, and the basal cell stands positive for high molecular weight keratin, which is why when there is a confusion between uh, whether it is a prostate cancer or a normal gland, we can stand for S M W K. Just a, a, a good to know information. And we all know from our basic MBBS that most of the adenocarcinoma prostate arises from the uh, arises from the peripheral zone. Only a minor percentage arises from the peripheral transversal zone and from the central zone. So, what are the symptoms and signs of this disease? So, if you want to say that I can cure someone of prostate cancer, the patient must be asymptomatic. What I mean to say is, if the patient is symptomatic or has some signs, the disease is more or less incurable. So a disease which can be cured will usually be diagnosed by screening. So in early stage there are no symptoms. Locally advanced cases they can present with features of uh, voiding LUTS like uh, obstructed voiding, poor stream, sometimes even renal failure. So uh, you might get a viva question in your uh, final MS exams. What is the cause of renal failure in CA prostate? You have to say that it's uh, growth in, uh, towards the trigon and uh, obstruction of both the urotic orifices. Some patients can present with hemospermia, so a patient about 40 years who presents with hemospermia has to be evaluated with a serum PSA. Importance and decreased exactly volume are other important uh, signs of uh, symptoms of uh, locally advanced disease. Metastatic disease, we all know that can, uh, prostate cancer usually spreads to the lumbar vertebra and, and to the long bones, so bone pain, pathological factors should always alarm you that the patient might be having uh, metastatic CA prostate, similarly anemia, lower limb edema. If you have asymmetrical lower limb edema or edema in the both lower limbs with uh, big limb nodes in the uh, in the in the immunal area, always think that the patient might have CA prostate. Do a rectal exam, send a send serum PSA. So lower limb edema. We, uh, I mean, uh, you can every now and then encounter patients with asymmetrical lower limb edema or even bilateral lower limb edema with obstructive voiding symptoms. Think of CA prostate. Sometimes retroperitoneal fibrosis, uh, DIC, and even paralysis. <clears throat> so, uh, as I already mentioned, CA prostate is one of the most common diseases in the Western world. So, how do they diagnose? They diagnose by screening. So, the term screening is used to test for disease among those, pe uh, those people who are asymptomatic. Whereas, we use the term diagnosis when we find disease among those patients who are symptomatic. So, by screening, we are trying to find disease among asymptomatic individuals, thereby trying to lower the mortality 
of the disease. So two large trials were conducted in the West, the PLCO trial in the United States and the ERSPC trial in Europe. The, PLC, the PLCO trial unfortunately did not show any survival advantage by screening with PSA and DRE for CA prostate. On the contrary, the European trial, the ERSPC trial, did show some mortality reduction after 13 years. The number needed to screen was 781 patients and the number needed to treat was 27 patients to reduce one mortality. So uh, herein lies the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the sad part of screening. Whereas we can reduce mortality, we can also cause a significant overdiagnosis and more important than that, we can cause overtreatment. As I already mentioned in the beginning of my, uh, of my slides, most of the cancer prostates are indolent, they are not that aggressive, so most of the cancer patients would not die of prostate cancer. So screening for prostate cancer might lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment and might lead, uh, lead to complications and reduce the quality of the life of the patient. So uh, this uh, fact has to be taken into this consideration. How is, PA, uh, how is screening done? It is done by estimating the serum PSA and doing a distal rectal examination. What about transrectal ultrasound? Transrectal ultrasound is not used for screening. It is not used for diagnosing prostate cancer. Okay? For screening prostate cancer, we use just PSA estimation and doing a good quality rectal exam. And uh, because uh, by, doing a, uh, by doing screening, we are trying to find patients at early stage whom we can cure. Where, uh, in general, we don't do screening for those whose life expectancy is less than 10 years. If you have a patient who is not going to survive more than 5 years, you don't do PSA screening for these patients. So how frequently should PSA screening be done? Uh, different guidelines and different things every 1 to 5 years. It has to be done annually for high risk patients and less frequently for low risk patients. Excuse me for this uh, typological error. For instance, if the baseline, if the median uh, PSA value uh, uh, for 40 to 49 years is regarded as 0 0.6, if it is more than 0 0.6 for an age group, for an individual who is 45 years, let's say, then it has to be done more frequently. The PSA estimation has to be done annually in such cases. And PSA predicts the risk of cancer prostate, but it actually doesn't diagnose CA prostate. Now we have to know an important fact. PSA is organ specific, that is it is specific to prostate gland, it is not disease specific, meaning PSA can get elevated in BPS, it can ele get elevated in UTI, in, it can get elevated in acute prostatitis after, after a vigorous prostatic massage, cystoscopy, so PSA is organ specific, it is not disease specific. There is no particular threshold at which which can trigger a biopsy in patients with elevated PSA. So when to biopsy uh, in case of CA prostate? When we have a suspicious rectal examination, uh, when the PSA is abnormal, uh, so A is an ethnicity adjusted, uh, a free PSA less than 10% and uh, currently uh, earlier it used, it used to be uh, told that uh, PSA value more than 4 nanogram per ml would trigger a biopsy. Currently, it's been decreased to up to 2.5 and 3. So, in the ERSPC trial, uh, PSA value more than 3 uh, triggered a biopsy. So, there are other parameters like uh, PSA velocity, uh, increasing PSA by more than 2.35 nanogram per, bit per hour if the PSA is less than 4, and the PSA velocity more than 0 0.5 if the PSA is more than 4. And in those patients who are taking finasteride, if the PSA doesn't decrease by 50% after one year, Remember in patients taking finasteride, uh, you, 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 you should always estimate repeat PSA after 6 to 12 months and the PSA levels should decrease by 50%. So if the initial PSA was 4, after 6 to 1 year it should be 2. If it is not 2, then you have to do a prostate biopsy. Other important fact is the PSA density measured by uh, dividing the PSA by volume of uh, gland. If it is more than 0.15, that's an indication for uh, doing a biopsy. So there are certain instances where the initial biopsy comes negative in spite of reduced PSA and you have to do a re-biopsy again. So indications for doing a re-biopsy are a rising or persistently high PSA, again a suspicious rectal exam. When there are certain things in the histology like uh, uh, a typical small acinar 
proliferation, high grade pin. These are the conditions where you might have to do a repeat biopsy. Again, when the initial biopsy is negative and the PSA is still high, it's always wise to obtain a multi-parametric MRI. Remember the word multi-parametric, a multi-parametric MRI prior to doing a repeat biopsy. Multi-parametric MRI is currently available in our, in our country as well. So prostate biopsy should be should always be an ultrasound guided biopsy. It can be transrectal ultrasound guided or transperineal ultrasound guided biopsy. <coughs> if you have between four to ten uh, 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 percentage free PSA calculated by estimating the free PSA and total PSA and taking the ratio will help us guide biopsy. So if the percentage free PSA is less than ten percent, we need to do a biopsy. 10 to 15 percent. So these are the guidelines given in uh, European urology. So I, I don't think I'll be speaking on this. Uh, uh, regarding uh, rectal examination, no conscious. Uh, uh, we have no conscious in what is actually abnormal. By doing a rectal exam, we are trying to assess not only the size of the gland but also the presence of nodules, any asymmetry in duration, any suspicious rectal exam. Uh, Findings uh, should be proved, should be proven with a biopsy. Uh, so, when to biopsy uh, in case of CA prostate? When we have suspicious rectal examination, uh, when the PSA is abnormal, uh, so is and ATC be adjusted, uh, a free PSA less than 10%, and uh, currently, uh, earlier it, was, it used to be uh, told that uh, PSA value more than 4 nanogram per ml would trigger a biopsy. Currently, it's been decreased to uh, up to 2.5 and 3. So, in the ERSPC trial, uh, PSA value more than 3 uh, triggered a biopsy. So, there are the parameters like uh, PSA velocity, uh, increasing PSA by more than 2.35 nanogram per mil per hour if the PSA is less than 4, and the PSA velocity more than 0.5 if the PSA is more than 4. And in those patients who are taking finasteride, if the PSA doesn't decrease by 50% after one year, Remember in patients taking finasteride, uh, you, 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 you should always estimate repeat PSA after 6 to 12 months and the PSA levels should decrease by 50%. So if the initial PSA was 4, after 6 to 1 year it should be 2. If it is not 2, then we have to do a prostate biopsy. Other important fact is the PSA density measured by uh, dividing the PSA by volume of uh, the gland. If it is more than 0.15, that's an indication for uh, doing a biopsy. So there are certain instances where the initial biopsy comes negative in spite of raised <coughs> PSA and you have to do a re-biopsy again. So indications for doing a re-biopsy are a rising or persistently high PSA, again a suspicious rectal exam. When there are certain things in the histology like uh, uh, a typical small acinar proliferation, high grade pin, these are the conditions where you might have to do a repeat biopsy. Again when the initial biopsy is negative and the PSA is still high, it's always wise to obtain a multi-parametric MRI. Remember the word multi-parametric, a multi-parametric MRI prior to doing a repeat biopsy. Multi-parametric MRI is currently available in our, in our country as well. So prostate biopsy should be should always be an ultrasound guided biopsy. It can be transrectal ultrasound guided or transperineal ultrasound guided biopsy. <coughs> it should not be a finger guided biopsy. <coughs> At least 8 to 12 cores should be taken. Mainly from the mainly from the peripheral zones, and we should also biopsy any suspicious areas in the gland. So when you are uh, reading the histology report of cancer prostate, two important terms always come: Gleason's grade and Gleason's score. So what is Gleason grade? It it denotes the architectural pattern of prostate gland. Remember, adenocarcinoma is cancer of the glands. Okay, so architectural pattern of prostate glands as seen in low power microscopy. So we don't use a high power microscope to assess the Gleason stage and score. Uh, cellular characteristics like mitosis, nuclei are not used and hence uh, you might be asked in the exam whether an FNSC is appropriate in CA prostate. The answer should be no because FNSC gives you an idea about maybe the mitosis, the cellular characters uh, but it doesn't give an idea about the architectural pattern of the gland. So you should always do a crooked biopsy and not an FNSC. And there are five Gleason grades: Gleason one to Gleason five. Gleason one is large, well-formed glands, well differentiated, whereas Gleason five means no glandular pattern at all, undifferentiated or poorly, poorly differentiated. So what then is the Gleason score? So we add Gleason's grade to get the Gleason score. So Gleason score is the sum of the most abundant grade 
and the second most abundant grade. For example, for example, if the most abundant grade was three and the second most abundant grade was four, the recent score would be seven. <coughs> Excuse me. If only one recent pattern was present, then you have to double it. For example, three plus three is equal to six. If three patterns of grades are present, then we add the most common and the highest grade. That is uh, as seen in this example. So if if we have a 70% listens grade one uh, and 10% listens grade one, uh, five, then the sum of listens uh, score would be four plus five is equal to nine. Recently, the IS, uh, the Interna International Society of Europath Europathologists, has tried to simplify listens score by using the listens grade as shown in the slide. So another important uh, uh, factor in management is the T stays. So by T1, we mean this is which is non palpable. So most of the prostate cancers these days in the Western world are T1C. Okay, T1C, which means that it is a screen detected cancer, PSS screening per se, high viral, biopsy uh, variable, myopathologic cancer. It is non palpable. T1 is after uh, CA prostate detected after TR, less than 5% of the TR specimens, more than 5% of the TR specimen, T1B. T2, you palpate a small, uh, you palpate a small nodule, but it is confined within the gland. T3, it, it has <coughs> penetrated the capsule, so T3 is extra capsular spread, and T3 T is invasion of the single vesicles, and T4 means invasion of the <coughs> adjacent structures. So I talked about uh, the PSA level, I talked about patient score, and I talked about TNF stage. So these are the three important parameters. These are the three, three important factors which helps us to stratify disease into low risk, high risk or intermediate risk for the sake of management. So, uh, <coughs> selection of treatment options for localized disease it, uh, depends on the risk factors, whether it is low risk, intermediate risk or high risk and on the general health of the patient and, its, and their life expectancy. So, active surveillance, sim almost similar to watchful waiting but active surveillance is more active, proactive uh, is indicated for patients who, who have life expectancy less than 10 years and who have low grade cancers. Uh, it is also now being developed in younger patients with low volume, low or intermediate grade up to business score, triple score is salmon, is got seven tumors to avoid or to delay treatment that might not be immediately required. See, the, the idea is to uh, over treat the patient, uh, it is to avoid over treating the patient. <coughs> when, a, when you subject patient to active surveillance, DRE and PSA should be measured quarterly or semi-annually and biopsy should be done six monthly or one yearly. The drawbacks of active surveillance is that the patient has to live with a constant fear of cancer and up to 50% of the patients in active surveillance they can progress. So the window of cure by doing a radical surgery might be lost for them. Radical prostatectomy can be done by open lab or robotic approaches these days. Most commonly it is done robotically. The advantages are that it, is, it can be curative, there is very minimal collateral damage, it can provide specimen for accurate pathological staging, and it is always easy to identify treatment failure after radical surgery. They talk about trifecta and pentafecta after radical surgery. Trifecta means trying to achieve biochemical recurrence free survival, prolonged survival without recurrence, trying to achieve continence of urine, and trying to achieve good erectile function after surgery. So these three combined constitute the trifecta. In the era of robotic surgery, they talk about pentafecta and you add absence of post-operative complications and negative surgical margins to this trifecta. So how do you select patients for radical surgery, radical prostatectomy? The patients should survive more than 10 years and the tumor should be biologically significant. That is, maybe patient score more than 6 but it has to be completely resectable. If it is not resectable, you should not subject the patient to surgery because he can have complications that can impair his quality of life. Can you use neoadjuvant hormones before surgery? The answer should be no. You should not use hormones prior to surgery. What about post-operative radiotherapy after surgery? You can use post-operative post radiotherapy in an adjuvant setting if there are adverse pathological findings, if the margin is positive, if there is investment of seminal vesicles or you can use salvage, uh, salvage post-op radiotherapy meaning when uh, you use radiotherapy when there is post-op biochemical recurrence. 
Regarding radiotherapy for localized disease, you can use either, uh, because uh, I'm running short of time, uh, I'll try to uh, squeeze into the limited amount of time which I have. You can use either external beam radiotherapy or brachytherapy. Heavy particle therapy is not used because of increased side effects. Uh, locally advanced disease, as I mentioned before, it is a disease which has gone beyond the confines of the capsule. So it is defined as T3, T4, N plus minus and M0. There is no standard treatment. It has to be a multimodal treatment. So either local, uh, either surgery or radiotherapy combined with systemic treatment, meaning either retro, uh, radical prostatectomy with lymph node, uh, lymph node dissection with adjuvant radiotherapy plus adjuvant hormone therapy or hormone therapy com uh, so, or radiotherapy combined with hormones. ATT is androgen, androgen deprivation treatment. What about metastatic disease? Metastatic disease is the kind of patients which uh, we frequently encounter in our country. Median survival is 42 months and systemic treatment is generally required unless the patient is asymptomatic or wishes to defer castration or he doesn't want to get castrated. Systemic, by, system, by systemic treatment we mean some form of androgen deprivation therapy or chemotherapy. So something about androgens. <coughs> androgens, uh, more than 90% of the androgens are secreted by the human gonads and the remaining 10% are secret, secreted by the adrenal glands. So if you look into this diagram, uh, most of the, almost all the androgens secreted by, uh, is formed from cholesterol and uh, uh, drugs like aminoglutathamide and ketoconazole would act at this level. Newer drugs like arbiraterol would act at this level and this level. Okay. So uh, there's uh, certain terms like ADT, uh, medical or surgical castration. Castration can be surgical, meaning we do a bilateral orchidectomy, or it can be medical meaning we use uh, either LHRX agonists or antagonists. So anti-androgens are drugs which antagonizes the androgen receptors, that is which blocks the androgen receptors. And we have a term called combined androgen blockade, uh, which means that we use, uh, which means uh, we combine castration with blockade of the androgen receptors. So orchidectomy is the most surest way of obtaining castrate level of uh, androgens. It is permanent. And uh, LSRS agonist, a typical drug is glucrolite. Uh, it is given by T-port injection. There is an initial flare for three to four weeks because it's an agonist, and uh, it will initially cause some increase in LS levels, and at this, uh, which then causes an increase in androgen levels. So it is always to be combined with anti-androgens for the first three to four weeks. A newer drug, a relatively recent advance is Digavelix again, which is LSRS antagonist. It is not associated with flare, and you don't have to use anti-androgens. Typical anti-androgen is bicalutamide. Uh, with the use of anti-androgens, the LS and uh, androgen levels rise because the testosterone feedback to pituitary and hypothalamus is also blocked. Because the uh, androgen level is normal, potency is preserved, and because there is a lot of there is increase in the level of androgen, it aromatizes to estrogen, so they can be gynecomastia. The other important side effect is uh, liver toxicity, so LFTs have to be done. Inzalutamide, another recent advance, it it is also an <coughs> So, there are drugs like inzalutamide and uh, other drugs. So, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop.